Hello everyone, this is part 4 of chapter 7, Flow Past Immersed Bodies. So the slides have been prepared using the textbook, Fluid Mechanics by Frank White. So, in the previous, uh, previous lecture, we talked about friction drag and uh, pressure drag. Oh, I forgot to mention that sometimes the pressure drag is also called the form drag. So now we want to see the importance of the pressure drag by looking at, you know, bodies with different shape. So as a refresher, we said that the friction drag is caused by viscosity, by friction of the fluid. And that's where the fluid is in contact with the boundaries of the object. Pressure drag is created as a result of a sudden drop in the pressure somewhere at the back or behind the object, as you see here. So for instance, in this case, in case A, <clears throat> because of the shape of this object, the flow, the boundary layer separates at these points naturally, and then the pressure drops significantly you know, uh, in the wake. So as a result, a large delta P between the front of the object and back of the object is created so this creates a drag force because pressure here is in the, in the front is greater than the pressure at the back so this creates a pressure force how about the friction friction uh, drag oh by the way here also we do have separation right at the front of the object this object is very like it's very non-ideal in terms of the pressure drag because right you know at the front edge at the front side of the object the the lay the fluid is separated but part of it is probably in stays in contact with the boundaries creating friction drag here so this is like a complex uh, uh, object in terms of you know how the boundary layer is developed in this case if we look at case B it is better in terms of the pressure in terms of the drag coefficient in case A the drag coefficient is 2 is quite large if we streamline the front edge the front surface then separation will not occur here anymore so in this sort of close to a streamline object the flow will simply follow the boundaries up to here and then at the back edges it will separate so in this case b we have actually decreased or we have postponed and pushed back the separation points as a result the drag coefficient, the total composite drag coefficient decreases. This drag coefficient represents both the friction drag and also pressure drag. If we move forward, we move one step forward and make this object even more streamlined. So then we will see case C. You see that this is more streamlined, meaning that it looks like the natural shape of, for instance, uh, fish. So, as a result, in this case, even though we may actually increase the friction drag, but because of the modification in the back of the object, the separation point is perhaps totally eliminated, or it is, you know, further pushed back. So the friction, the total drag force is now 0.15. In case C, of course, we increase the friction drag, but we significantly reduce the pressure drag. So case C is the most ideal, and no wonder that uh, most uh, state-of-the-art, state-of-the-art like uh, automobiles, they do follow a streamlined shape in order to reduce the pressure drag. So it's interesting to compare case C with D, it's said that in case D, we do have a circular cylinder with the same drag 
as KC. <clears throat> so it doesn't mention though the the cross-sectional the the widths, but if you look at it for same drag force, you see that this cylinder is very small, doesn't have much surface area, but it creates a very large uh, pressure drag because of the separation. So in this cylinder, we do have a large pressure drag, but for KC, the streamlined object, the pressure drag is minimized or is perhaps zero. Instead, we do have a friction drag on all the boundaries of this object. So you see making the, the body uh, streamlined will have a very important and significant effect in reducing the drag force. So, the, so basically the conclusion and summary of this slide is that if you do have objects with sharp edges, like what you see in A, then you have flow separation. And when you have flow separation, then you create a large pressure force and pressure drag. So in design for design purposes, in order to reduce the drag force because of the pressure drag component, you need to round, uh, you need to basically round or streamline uh, the, the shape of the body. So from A to B to C, the body, the geometry becomes more streamlined. And as a result, the overall drag coefficient decreases from 2 to 1.1 to 0.15. This is figure 716. It has, it contains very important information <coughs> about the drag coefficient. So in A, so this is for, first of all, some assumptions are made, a smooth bodies and low Mach number. So it's like low Mach numbers. I don't know. We need to check the details of how low, but perhaps for uh, subsonic for sure, not supersonic. So because in supersonic flows, we do see other effects as well. All right. So this is only, in other words, only the effect of the Raynor's number. The effect of the Mach number is not considered. And also it's a smooth. So the effect of the roughness is not considered in these diagrams. So all values of CD are based on planform area, means the area that we look from the top, except for the normal uh, plate, for the plate normal to the flow that we will talk about <clears throat> soon. So in A, we do have two dimensional bodies in B we have three dimensional bodies okay so let's look at case A first two dimensional bodies it means that perpendicular to the screen they are like very long perpendicular to the to the screen so first the first one is a smooth flat plate so for a smooth flat plate, if you remember, the drag coefficient CD was a function of Raynor's number raised to the power of, I don't remember exactly on top of my head, but it was a function of Raynor's number raised to the power of something. But how come this line is linear? Because this is a log-log uh, coordinate system. So it's been converted to log. So a log equation will become a linear equation on a log log coefficient. So you see here the curve for a, a smooth flat plate parallel to a stream and it is only for the laminar flow because it's it only considers the phase of Raynor's number not the roughness. So it stops here at transition which is 5 times 10 to the 5 something like that. Beyond this Raynor's number the flow becomes turbulent so the drag coefficient is, is a function of both Raynor's number or actually if it's uh, if the if the Raynor's number is large enough it's only a function of the roughness so it is not listed here 
for flat plate, we would need to go back and use the previous diagrams. Uh, some other cases, a very important one is a smooth circular cylinder. A smooth circular cylinder that you see here for two conditions. One is that L over D is infinity. L means the length of the cylinder in the direction perpendicular to the screen. So it's a very long cylinder. D is the diameter of the cylinder. And there is another case, L over D equal to 5. So it's like a limited length like cylinder, so like a piece of a, a, a tube. But it is placed, so if this is the cylinder, for instance the cylinder, then the flow is like, it's a cross flow. So as you see, the drag coefficient decreases with an increase in the Reynolds number. And then all of a sudden, at Reynolds about 5 times 10 to the 5, at this Reynolds number, you see a, a, a decline, a rapid drop in the drag coefficient. And this happens because of uh, this happens. Uh, this happens because of the uh, because of the change in the turbulent flow. Uh, after that, it increases again. So here we see the drag coefficients for several other, for instance, uh, for a pigeon, vulture natural uh, bird, these are birds, seagull, and uh, sailplane is better than like some of these birds, airfoil is better than these birds because it's been you know designed based on engineering principles, even better than the natural ones. Okay, what else here we have a square cylinder Square, square cylinder, so it means that it is a, it's actually squared, so perpendicular to the screen, it's the same uh, <clears throat> uh, dimensions. We do see separation here, so that's the care for it. We do see a, a plate normal to a stream, so usually the plates are in line with the stream, but what if you have a plate normal to the stream, so something like this. So in this case, the area to find the drag force is actually the frontal area, or uh, in other words, the area, uh, the frontal area, the area perpendicular to the flow. In all other cases, the area to be used to find the drag force is the plan form area, or the area that you see from the top. <clears throat> so in part B, in figure B, we have like three-dimensional objects, ellipso, ellipsoid, disk normal to stream. So this is a disk normal to a stream, like a circular disk, but it's normal to the stream, it's three-dimensional. And... Uh, Or perhaps I should go by and correct myself, this square cylinder, yeah, so since this square cylinder is two-dimensional, so it means that these two dimensions that you see here are equal, but perpendicular to the plane of the screen, it is infinitely long. And for, the, for this case, when you have a disk, it's three-dimensional because it is just a three-dimensional object. You cannot just look at a cross-section. And here we have a case that we look at later. So for the case of a sphere, this is the curve of the drag is very similar to a sphere. There is this sharp drop when the Reynolds number increases, goes about five times 10 to the five. So it becomes uh, turbulent, when it becomes turbulent, 
the separation point moves backward, the, the, the pressure drag decreases. Airship hull, it, it has a low CD as re, because it's required for the purpose. And here we do see something, a Stokes law. So we are gonna talk about Stokes law in the next slide. For a Stokes law, the direct force is CD equal to 24 divided by Reynolds number. So it, this looks like as an analytical solution. All other things, all other data are based on experiments. But this one is like, seems that because it's like an analytical like a solution, so we do see a kind of nice and neat equation. So we're gonna talk about the Stokes flow. And you see that this is for very small Reynolds numbers. Reynolds number 0 0.1 up to one, and uh, after that, you see deviation in the drag coefficient. So let's go and look at uh, the Stokes number, a Stokes flow, which is the Stokes flow is the uh, flow over a sphere, but for a very small Reynolds number. So this sphere that you see at the beginning, it has a high uh, the right coefficient and then and it's linear but then afterwards it will show a different trend so let's see what is a stokes flow okay okay so creeping flow or stokes flow is low Reynolds number flows so if you look at the governing equations continuity and Navier-Stokes equations. If the Reynolds number is very small, less than one, it can be shown. It, this, just by looking at it, you will not realize that, but it can be shown by making the equations non-dimensional. You can see that if Reynolds number is very small, the acceleration terms are much smaller than the other terms, like the than the viscosity or the shear rate term and the pressure gradient term. So for such cases, Reynolds number much smaller than one. This is like exactly the opposite to the boundary layer assumption and boundary layer theory. In the boundary layer theory, Reynolds number is much larger than one. So we uh, uh, simplify the equations in a different way. Now, if Reynolds number is much smaller than one, the opposite, then they are simplified in a different way. So if the acceleration terms are negligible, the Navier-Stokes equation becomes a balance between the pressure forces and the viscous forces. So the right side is equal to zero. So then that makes you know the, the equation much simpler and uh, their uh, solutions, analytical solutions can be found for some special cases. For instance, for a sphere, if we also change the coordinate system to uh, a spherical coordinate system, then the force, then the, the equation can be solved. So the equation can be solved and this, uh, and therefore, we can find the forces acting on the sphere. The forces will be only because of friction, because the Reynolds number is so low, basically the flow will just follow the shape of the sphere, so very nicely. So uh, it's, it's basically the friction force and can be found as three pi mu, the viscosity of the fluid, velocity of the free stream u and diameter of the sphere. And if we divide it by one over rho u squared, and also divided by the like frontal area or planform area of the sphere, which is the area of just a circle. A circle that cuts through the sphere is has an area of pi d squared over four, not the total area of the sphere, just the area, the frontal area or the planform area. So just the area of one sphere that cuts through the sphere. 
the area of one circle that cuts through the sphere. So if we substitute these numbers, then we see that CD, the drag coefficient, becomes 24 divided by Reynolds number as of based on D, the diameter of the sphere. So this relation is plotted in the previous, in the diagram of the previous slide, and it's good for Reynolds number smaller than one. Okay, so the drag forces for some other shapes, some other geometries that we encounter in engineering problems. So, for instance, you may encounter uh, wind or water passing through like, like something like this, a thin plate normal to a wall, different shapes. So let's look at these tables. It provides very useful uh, applied information. So this table gives a few data on drag, drag coefficient CD based on frontal area. So actually the table says that CD based on frontal area. Frontal area means like the area normal uh, to the cross flow. And this is for two dimensional bodies of various cross sections at Reynolds greater than 10 to the 4. So we need to make sure that uh, the conditions are satisfied when we want to use them. The sharp edged bodies, the sharp edged bodies which tend to cause flow separation regardless of the character of the boundary layer are actually insensitive to, to the Reynolds number. And what you see here, most of them are sharp edged. And uh, the elliptic cylinders being smoothly rounded have the laminar to turbulent transition effect that we see here and we will talk about soon. And therefore sensitive to whether the boundary layer is laminar or turbulent. Okay, so for a square cylinder, two-dimensional, it's very long, uh, perpendicular to the screen. And actually, we did have it in the in the previous curve. Uh, CD was sort of a, a flat line, a constant line. So CD equal to 2.1. So this is a square cylinder, which is very long, perpendicular to the uh, to the screen. So what you see on the these are all for two-dimensional bodies. So it means that we are looking at the cross-section. 2.1 is very large because of the flow separation on the front edges and back edges. If you make it round, like half circle, like half, half cylinder, it's half cylinder, right? CD is 1.2, smaller than this case, than a square cylinder, but still we do have flow separation. We do have flow separation here and uh, here, therefore we do have a large pressure drag. A flat plate, which is normal to the flow, we had it in the previous uh, uh, graph as well, CD of two. Diamond shape, this shape you see uh, decreased CD because the flow will kind of move over the surface and then it will separate at this point. So compared to the square cylinder, this form, if you just turn it, you see that you have a, you have this as the same square cylinder. If you, you have it like this, if you turn it, you can decrease the drag coefficient a lot. Half cylinder, but the other way around, if the flow is blown from the other side, you can intuitively tell that CD of this half cylinder is higher than the CD of the same half cylinder, but exposed to the cross flow from the different, from the opposite direction. Because here you do have the separation from here. So larger drag for uh, pressure force 
pressure dry compared to uh, the, the, the other one. And this is a thin plate, normal to a wall, 1.4, and uh, half tube, if 1.2, the other way larger, you can see that it's in, most of them can be seen intuitively. Just by looking, you should be able to actually tell which, if you compare some of these objects, if you compare some of them, you should be able to tell what, uh, which one has a higher, for instance, the lag coefficient. And in the uh, FE exam, you will get this kind of question. So you may be given uh, the first four uh, bodies that you see here, and you will be asked which one has the, the highest or the least dry coefficient. So if you compare the first four, square cylinder, and then uh, turned or turned a square cylinder compared to half cylinder, by looking at it, you should be able to tell which one has the highest and lowest CD. So the bottom part of this table, a rounded uh, nose section. So it has two dimensions, L and H. And depending on the ratio of L over H, the drag coefficient is given. And then we have a flat nose section, or is it a flat? Yeah, so again, this is in terms of L over H with different values of L over H. Uh, CD changes, you see that it first it increases and then it decreases. So as you increase, decrease these ratios, you play with the con uh, contribution of the friction drag and pressure drag. So there is some optimal, for instance, optimal point where it gives you the best or the lowest, for instance, drag coefficient. Okay, and uh, this is for round bodies, elliptical cylinder. This is a, a circular cylinder, ratio of one over one. And then for laminar flow versus turbulent flow, for turbulent CD drops, for laminar is larger. We saw it in the curve in the previous uh, slide. So we saw a sudden drop in the CD when uh, the flow from laminar becomes turbulent. Uh, if the aspect ratio changes, the value of CD is change. Okay, so another table. So this is table 7.3. And this lists the drag coefficients for three dimensional bodies. The previous table was for two dimensional. This is for three dimensional. For instance, you see a cube here. In the previous slide, it was a uh, square cylinder, very slender, very long, but this is just a cube. It's three dimensional. So CD based on frontal area. So need to make sure this, these areas are needed when we want to convert CD, the drag coefficient, to drag force. And then if, when this uh, cube is uh, like tilted 45 degrees, how it changes and different objects, all of this is like a cup. So it's a cup, so it's 3D. So this cup is different, it's not 2D, so it's like a cup. It has a three-dimensional shape. It is, if it's like this, it's 2D previous slide, but when it's like this, it becomes 3D, this one. It's like a bucket, for instance. And uh, a disc, it's circular, and also different cases. <coughs> Uh, it's a little bit small, so when you can actually check the book, the textbook, and also the 
the PPTs, the PPTs of the course in order to magnify it and see this in, in better resolution. So here we do have a cone with the, when the angle changes, the drag coefficient changes and uh, different cases an average person this is probably this is probably very practical cb of an average person and uh, i really cannot see the details written here So it says that CD times the area of the person is equal to the number given there. So this is something uh, we need to probably later I will get back to about this. I really not sure what it is exactly. <laughs> then for a tree, so we do have again the CD depending on the conditions given here for a truck from the side uh, at the bottom again we do see other objects for different conditions for different aspect ratios and so on so round bodies like the ellipsoid have drag that depend on the point of separation and body length will generally decrease pressure drag by making the body rel relatively more slender but sooner or later the friction drag will catch up okay this is important so look at, let's look at this cylinder so this cylinder is now placed in the direction of the flow it's not before we in two dimensional the cylinder if this is the cylinder in two dimensional case it was the cross flow was perpendicular to this the cylinder now we are now actually the stream and the cylinder are head on so in this case if you look at l over d so when you increase when l over d is small the drag coefficient is large as you increase the ratio of l over d then you see that if you increase the length the friction coefficient will the friction drag will increase but the pressure drag will decrease first but if you make the cylinder so long then the friction drag may become excessive and larger than the pressure drag contribution so cd may again increases so there is a balance or compromise between minimizing the sum of pressure drag and friction drag so at some extremes the pressure drag may be very large friction very small but then the pressure drag may be minimized and then but friction drag may be too large so there is an optimal po optimal point in the case of uh, this cylinder head on in the flow the optimal l over d is equal to two when it's equal to 2, you see the minimum the right coefficient. <clears throat> okay, so is there anything important? You see it for a parachute, the drag coefficient of 1.2. This is also important because this, so when you want to design a parachute for a particular application, you need to be able to calculate the drag force and the the terminal velocity and so that for instance uh, it does not hit the ground you know at too high velocity so this is like a very practical case if you need the larger drag force then you would need to make the area of the parachute for instance larger if you need more drag force to decelerate like uh, the decline of a person or a load and so on <clears throat> okay.
Okay, so uh, let's see what we have in the, this lecture is becoming long. Let's see what we will have in the next slide. So back to this person, it seems that I cannot figure out this is the, <clears throat> it seems that it, it's telling that if the person is, so if this is a person and this is the flow, then the person may be facing the flow or it may be standing sideways. So depending on whether it's facing the flow, if it's facing the flow, then the drag coefficient will be higher than, it, than the person is standing sideways. Because when it's facing the flow, there is flow separation. And when it's sideways, it is like the separation is like a decline. So that probably refers to that but it's not very clear from this table. Anyway. Okay. Okay, so let's do this example as well to understand what we were talking about so far. So according to reference 12, the drag coefficient of a blimp based on surface area is approximately uh, 0 0.006 if Raynor's number is greater than 10 to the 6. A certain blimp is 75 meter long and has a surface area of 3,400 square meter. Estimate the power required to propel this blimp at 18 meter per second at a standard altitude of 1,000 meter. All right, so it seems that there is a lot to find. So at this altitude, we need to go ahead and find the density and viscosity to find the Reynolds number. So this is this can be found from table A6. If you are concerned about the exam, in the exam it will be given or you need to go uh, look them up from the table. So the density and the temperature up there at this altitude you know, that's the average temperature and then the viscosity from that table. So based on this, the Reynolds number, rho u l over mu. Uh, it is found 8.6 times 10 to the 7. So it is, uh, it is great. The Reynolds number that we have is greater than 10 to the 6 because the reference says that this CD is for Raynor's greater than 10 to the 6. Then we go ahead and we can, we are okay. We are sure that CD is equal to 0 0.006. So therefore we can go ahead and find the drag force. So the given uh, drag coefficient is valid because Raynor's number is larger than 10 to the 6. We can compute the drag and the power. And don't forget that power is equal to force times velocity. So when you have a translational motion, like a car driving at a constant velocity, power, this is power, not uh, pressure. Power is equal to the force, like drag force at like no acceleration at, you know, cruise uh, motion power is equal to force times the velocity so force is drag force times the velocity head times the area the wet area so everything is given in the problem so and the area is given, the velocity is given, velocity we needed to find the drag force. So you find the drag force, if you multiply it by the velocity here, then you get the power, 66,000 watts. So the comments, these are nominal estimates. Drag is highly dependent on both, both shape and Reynolds number. So, and the coefficient CD, which was assumed constant here, is cons well, it does have uncertainty in it. 
and also we should know that in the atmosphere you know in this at 1000 meter again the properties can fluctuate during day and night whether it's windy or not so these are just some uh, estimates you know to get an idea of the uh, for instance the drag force here in this condition so detailed design requires more articulate you know investigation of variations in these parameters okay so let's stop here and in the next part of this uh, lecture this chapter we will talk about aerodynamic forces on road vehicles